Financial stability is a term that has been popping up a lot in recent months. Bank failures in the US and Switzerland have people asking how stable our financial system is, while high inflation and interest rate hikes continue to affect people, banks and companies. We've just released our latest financial stability review, which twice a year looks at just that. Today, we'll talk about whether our financial system is stable, and we'll take a closer look at the risks we see for two big areas, banks and property markets. You're listening to the ECB podcast, bringing you insights into the world of economics and central banking. My name is Katie Ranger. I'm joined today by John Fell, who works in our financial stability department here at the ECB and is actually a regular guest here on the podcast. Nice to see you again, John. Thanks, Katie. Um, It's great to be back. Now, I say it almost every time, John, but it's only been six months since we last spoke. And once again, quite a bit has happened. Some good, some not so good. On the one hand, energy prices have come down. And the supply chain disruptions that we saw across the world are easing. The economy is continuing to recover from the pandemic and companies are making good profits. So that's all very positive. But on the other hand, inflation is still high and rising interest rates are weighing on people's debt burdens. Now, more recently, huge shocks in the US and and the Swiss banking sectors caught everybody off guard, I think it's fair to say. And this has shifted more focus onto the resilience of banks in this new environment. Now, John, there is really a lot to unpack in this edition of the report, but I want to talk specifics with you. Can you tell us one positive thing that you've seen over the past six months and perhaps two things that you're worried about going forward? Sure. Um, So, I mean, I'm I'm glad you asked for a positive um, as we do aim for balance in our assessments. And this edition is by no means all doom and gloom. Um, So at a moment when sentiment towards the banking sector, as you mentioned, basically across all advanced economies turned decisively negative, I think the silver lining has to be uh, the resilience of euro area banks. If you just look at bank stock prices, markets have clearly discriminated in favor of euro area banks. And that's something we haven't seen in the past. And it's in large part thanks Uh, to all the effort that went into strengthening banks' capital and also their liquidity buffers. But it's not only that. Uh, Banks' asset quality has improved uh, to a point where non-performing loans, but here I mean non-performing loan ratios, really couldn't get much lower. And many banks have reported strong profits for the first quarter of the year. Uh, So we still think the main sources of risk reside outside the banking system. Okay, so what are the things that are worrying you then? Okay, so on the negative side, and and you asked for two. Uh, So first, I mean, after the exceptionally strong rebound in financial markets at the start of the year, I think we can say that some of the old concerns have returned. Uh, So asset valuations are stretched again. And as central banks have been pulling back from asset purchases, um, that's basically meant that two-way risk has returned, uh, while market liquidity is eroding. Um, And that's making markets, especially bond markets, vulnerable to adverse dynamics or episodes of intense volatility. And second, even though there are signs that vulnerabilities in the non-bank sector are easing, uh, we see investment funds adopting more cautious strategies, for example, uh, we still have concerns that some of them may not be holding sufficient amount of liquid securities uh, to cope with stress. By liquid securities, I mean assets that could be easily sold, if necessary, and quickly, and without moving prices. We know that investors uh, are often spooked by unusually large asset price declines. And in situations like that, some can even panic and look for their money back. Holding liquid assets allows funds to absorb shocks like that, or uh, if if they're using derivatives, uh, to meet margin calls. But if they don't have li- sufficient amount of liquid assets available, they might find themselves in a situation where they're forced into selling uh, less liquid assets in a hurry, and of course at low prices. And that could amplify market stresses even further. Uh, so these two negatives um, have the potential to reinforce one another. 
Okay, so we're going to be keeping an eye on markets and and non-banks, and I'm hearing that liquidity is really the word uh, of the moment there. Let's zoom in now on one area that you've already mentioned and, and where we've seen a lot happening since we last spoke, and that's banks. Now, we had three US banks failing in the space of just a few weeks, and during that time, Global Bank uh, Credit Suisse was also taken over by UBS in in Switzerland. For some, it no doubt brought back memories of the fear and the the turmoil of of 2008. John, can you talk us through how this episode has affected banks here in the euro area? You won't find anything in the the last issue of our FSR. So that's a November issue suggesting that the epicentre of financial stability was lurking in the banks. Um, And if you were to leaf through the pages of the financial stability report uh, that the Fed published last November, there are a few hints there either. So it's really been a complete surprise. It has been a total surprise. So... But the effects on euro area banks were very limited. Uh, We did see uh, large drops in bank stock and bond prices, uh, especially on so-called AT1 instruments and also credit default swap spreads widened. But there were no serious stresses of the kind that we saw in 2008 um, and, and tensions eased very quickly. So why was that? Well, I mean, banking crisis can spread through at least three channels. Um, And so let me just mention those channels, uh, interconnection between banks, uh, common exposures to the same risks, um, or simply swings in in confidence or sentiment. So if if we think about the first channel, uh, all of the banks that failed in the US were regional banks. So they were not international banks, but regional banks. And Mm -hmm. also by definition, uh, interconnection with euro area banks was there was somebody was very very limited as for common exposures uh, the idiosyncratic business model of silicon valley bank is often pointed out as setting it apart uh, there was an article in the wall street journal uh, where there was a quote uh, for startups all roads lead to silicon valley bank and that was true uh, it took deposits from startups it extended loans to them and it even invested in them And that business model was working fine as long as the tech sector was booming, as it did during the the pandemic. Mm. Deposits were coming in and the funds were were sent back out to work uh, in the tech sector. The music stopped, though, uh, when the loan demand of tech firms weakened um, and the deposits were continuing to flow in. Uh, So the bank needed to earn an income uh, to pay those depositors, many of whom had large accounts well in excess of the $250,000 deposit insurance threshold. So that's basically how much the government, 250 k is how much the government would pay back immediately in, a, in, in, in the case of a bank, right, bank exactly. failure. Um, and so to pay the depositors, uh, it chose to do that by investing in U.S. treasuries. Uh, now, essentially, what the bank was doing was taking two massive bets. The first was uh, betting that interest rates wouldn't rise. And the second was that their clients wouldn't withdraw their their deposits. Of course, as we saw, neither of those bets paid off. In Mm. fact, deposits left because interest rates rose, with depositors fleeing on a scale and at a speed never seen before. Now, there are no systemically important banks in the euro area with business models like that. And so up to a point, uh, the common exposure channel has not really been relevant in the euro area either. Now, I say up to a point because it's not uncommon for banks to invest in government securities, uh, but not on the scale that Silicon Valley that, that, that Silicon Valley Bank did. So, I mean, it, it's positive for euro area banks, but it's not that we didn't feel it at all in, in the euro area, right? Right. Um, there was substantial repricing of euro area bank stocks, uh, bond prices also. Arguably, uh, the confidence channel was relevant here uh, with, with, with investors in bank securities asking what I would, what I would say describe as what if questions. So mm. the pricing of complex securities like AT1s uh, is based on assumptions and, and probabilities. Now, if those assumptions are questioned or if those probabilities change, that can be a recipe for repricing and also volatility. Now, after Silicon Bank, Silicon Valley Bank was closed by the FDIC, investors in euro area banks were asking, how would the value of senior bonds be affected if all depositors, so that's both insured and uninsured, were made whole in a resolution? 
Now, as that is not foreseen in, in, in the European resolution framework, uh, it would actually make them worse off. Likewise, after Credit Suisse was taken over by UBS, markets were surprised by the full write-down uh, of ET1 bonds. Mm. Now, this time we, and here I mean the ECB, uh, together with the EBA and the Single Resolution Board, came out rapidly with a, with a communication which clarified that this is not foreseen uh, in the EU framework. And from the feedback that we've heard from market participants, that helped to ease the tensions. Okay, so that that's good news. But is there anything in the turmoil that could be seen as a warning flag uh, for us here in the euro area or, or even a lesson learned? So the turmoil, I mean, it's, it's really raised many issues uh, across the effectiveness of, of market discipline, um, regulation, supervision, resolution frameworks. Um, the list is too long to go through everything. But on, on the positive side, and with, with, with all the shocks that banks have had to contend with since the outbreak of COVID-19 and since we've been doing these podcasts, followed by the Russian invasion of Ukraine and now this, I think we have evidence that Basel III has genuinely helped uh, in safeguarding financial stability. Okay, so Basel III, is, uh, they're the rules that, that govern things like capital uh, for banks, capital yeah, requirements. We, exactly. Um, and that we've also learned that bank resolution choices made in one jurisdiction can have spillovers to other jur- jurisdictions. So the what if questions that I mentioned, mm. that's new. Um, but if I was to pick out one lesson, uh, the speed and scale of bank runs witnessed in the US really stands out as a warning flag. Now, there was a study published very recently by the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis uh, that compared the three recent runs on US regional banks with earlier episodes. So, for example, in the case of Washington Mutual Bank, and that was the largest US bank failure uh, in, in September 2008. Mm. 10% of deposits were lost over 16 days uh, before it failed. Now, fast forward 15 years, and Silicon Valley Bank lost 25% of its deposits in a single day. And had it not been closed, it could have lost a further 62% the next business day. That's incredible. We haven't seen anything like that before. and that, But th- the case was special, uh, as many of the depositors knew one another personally, mm. and that appears to have speeded up the run. But if you look at also at, at First Republic, I mean, that's the latest recent failure in, in, in the US, 50 per, 57% of, it, of its deposits were lost in about 10 days. So in comparison uh, with Washington Mutual, the, the, you could say that the intensity was about five times greater. So, I mean, you say that the, the speed and, and the scale of these bank runs really stood out, but what exactly contributed to it? What was behind it? Well, the factors that are are often cited as drivers of the speed and scale of bank runs uh, include the share of of insured deposits in the total. Uh, insured depositors won't run. Uh, electronic banking um, and the influence of social media uh, in spreading information. Mm, that was that was something quite new, I'd say here, yeah, though, right? Compared to two thousand and eight. It was, and I think care is going to be needed in the final diagnosis of the role of each of those factors and the role that they played in in what we saw. Now, it certainly looks like social media, in combination with electronic banking, speeded up the runs. Mm. But then look at the the funding of of Silicon Valley Bank. Six percent of the depositors were insured. So 94 94 percent were not, and their incentives to run were were, were huge. Uh, If you look at Washington Mutual, more than 74% of deposits were insured. And that might explain why we saw lower intensity uh, in that run. Now, if it does turn out to be the case, uh, the flip side of all of the benefits that we've been enjoying of electronic banking is the potential for faster runs, uh, then then that could well have implications uh, for the amounts of liquid assets that banks will need to hold uh, to avoid situations where liquidity stresses uh, are transformed into solvency crises and so quickly, the crisis managers don't even have a chance to respond. OK, so this kind of leads on to another important topic uh, in the financial stability review. And it's something we've talked about before, John, and that's bank profitability. Now, a lot of factors go into how profitable a bank is. And if we just think about where we stand right now, after years of cheap money, it's it's gotten more expensive for banks to get funding because we're raising interest rates here at the ECB to fight inflation. Now, previously on the podcast, John, we've talked about how 
banks' profitability has been low, and that's something that we've been concerned about. How do things look now for banks in, in this new environment? So, I mean, as interest rates um, have been rising, uh, banks are having to pay more for their funding, uh, as you said. Um, and that's particularly true uh, for market funding. And ju just to give an idea, uh, the average rate that banks were paying on senior unsecured bonds at the end of 2021, so 18 months ago or so, was it wasn't much more than 0%. Now they're paying closer to 4%. That's a big change. Mm. Um, but the, con the, the contribution of bond funding uh, to the total um, is only about 15%. So banks only get about 15% of their funding on average uh, from the bond markets. Far more important are deposits. And they, count for about, they account for about 70% of banking sector funding. That's a big amount. Much more than I expected. It ensures stable funding for the banks. And I mean, also, uh, as interest rates have risen, uh, banks were able to pass through uh, higher interest rate costs uh, actually far more rapidly to their loans than to their deposits. Now, we've seen it in the in the first quarter, uh, financial results of the banks. This has given a boost to their profitability. So that's, yeah, uh, the higher interest rates so far have boosted profitability. But we don't expect that to last for too long um, as we, and again, the, the ECB that is, uh, retreat from asset purchases and as T LTRO uh, funding is repaid, that's going to induce more competition among the banks for funds. So we can expect further pass through the deposits over time, uh, and that's going to erode uh, that boost that we've seen to, prof to profitability. Okay, I wanna revisit uh, a different topic now that we spoke about in our last episode back in November, John, and that's real estate markets. Now back then we discussed that although house prices were still rising, there was a possibility of things being at, shall we say, a turning point after a very long boom cycle. What exactly have we seen in the last six months? How have things developed since then? So, uh, well, first of all, if I look at housing markets first, they've continued to, con continue to show signs of cooling down. Uh, now, that was to be expected as affordability, obviously. Uh, worsens as interest rates increase. So by cooling down, you mean that prices aren't rising as fast as they were? Uh, or even that they're in some cases declining, but the, the, mm. the, the, the downturn ha has been orderly. So I mean, nominal, nominal prices are below their peaks in some countries. Uh, but so far, if you, com if you compare the year on year house prices, so comparing how they are today relative to a year ago, they're, st they're still actually positive, uh, mm. or they were still actually positive during the final quarter of last year. Now, that said, uh, disorderly adjustment can't be ruled out um, now because we, we haven't seen the full pass through. Higher interest rates uh, are going to raise mortgage borrowing costs and that's a process that is obviously taking place more rapidly in countries where people have variable rate mortgages, mm. where, 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 where that's the prevalent way of, 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 of borrowing to buy a house. Now, some indications of this, uh, I think, were apparent uh, in the sharp reduction of mortgage demand that was revealed in our latest bank lending survey. Um, and we also saw in that survey the simultaneous tightening of credit standards by banks for mortgage lending. And that suggests uneasiness, let's say, among banks to increase uh, their housing market exposures. So that means that they're basically making it harder or they're, they're, they're making their standards more restrictive for people to get mortgages. Yes. And how about the commercial real estate front? So, I mean, on commercial real estate, the downturn is it, it's more firmly entrenched. Uh, the first quarter data uh, that we've seen, it's reported in our review, which shows valuations and transactions uh, are both contracting and they're contracting at double digit rates. Now, it looks like what's happening is demand has declined, uh, but we think that supply has reduced as well uh, so that liquidity in the commercial property market has been eroded too. So you might ask, why might that be? Well. The way I think about it is that just like the denial stage of the five stages of grief, uh, it can take time uh, for valuations to reflect the true market reality. And so unwillingness to sell at low prices might explain why we see low transactions now. But ultimately, uh, the future market dynamics are going to depend on the cash flows, the rents basically that are generated mm -hmm. by those properties. And they are vulnerable to Things like, for example, adverse economic growth surprises or interest rate surprises. 
Well, I don't think I've ever heard the five stages of grief being used for <laughs> real estate markets, but uh, that's super interesting. Thank you so much, uh, John. As always, this has been a really insightful conversation. And I hope that the next few months will bring some calm on the financial stability front. Now, before we wrap up, we ask all our guests on the podcast for a hot tip linked to the topic that we've been discussing today. So broadly speaking, financial stability. John, your hot tips are always very interesting and and useful, very practical. So what have you got for us today? So um, since we spent a bit of time today discussing bank runs, um, I have two movie recommendations for those listeners who would like to learn more about bank runs, how they can happen, how damaging they can be. So the recommendations are Mary Poppins. Uh, It was a 1960 movie starring Julie Andrews and Dick Van Dyke. And the other is It's a a Wonderful Life. Uh, That was a 1946 movie starring uh, James Stewart and Donna Reed. Now, in Mary Poppins, the trouble starts when a boy is overheard shouting, give me my money back. Now he's shouting at the bank manager and misunderstanding what is going on. One woman says to another, there's something wrong. The bank won't give someone their money. And so you can imagine what happens next. Mm. Um, In It's a Wonderful Life, there is a great scene after the run where James Stewart's character is in a discussion with his uncle. The uncle is asking, how does something like this ever start? Now, I've I've often wondered whether these movies had provided inspiration for Diamond and Didvig to write their Nobel Prize winning paper uh, in 1983. And that paper showed that runs can happen even when a bank is sound. Once depositors become nervous that other depositors will run and that they will run before they do, a solvent bank can soon become an insolvent one. And that was the big insight of that paper. So two really interesting um, hot tips again there, John. And they really highlight the the psychology behind it all, I think, as well, which is, is the key factor, the human factor here. This brings us to the end of this episode. I want to thank John Fell from our Financial Stability Department for joining the conversation today. Thank you so much, John. Thank you very much. Now, listeners, be sure to check out the show notes for more on this topic. You've been listening to the ECB podcast with Katie Ranger. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe and leave us a review. Until next time, thanks for listening.